Welcome and thank you for joining us for Human Kinetics webinar. Are you overtraining in the weight room? Understanding overtraining and sport performance. My name is Alexis Kuntz and I'm an Associate Director of Social Media and Marketing at Human Kinetics and I will be the facilitator for today's presentation. The webinar is scheduled for one hour and the session is being recorded and will be available for playback. By the end of the day tomorrow, you can expect an email containing the link to the recording. A certificate of participation for today's webinar will also be attached to that email. Due to the large number of participants today, you'll be able to hear me and our presenter, but will not be able to speak directly with us. If you're having problems with the audio, you may call in by clicking the Use Telephone option in the audio tab and dialing in with the number and audio pin provided. You may also send questions anytime through the Questions tab or the chat box in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. We'll allow time at the end of the presentation for a question and answer session. To submit questions during the webinar, use the question function located above the chat function. Just type your question in the box and click send, and I'll collect the questions and provide them to the presenter during the Q&A. We're looking forward to a great presentation today, but first I'd like to give you a little bit more information about our presenter. Andrew C. Fry, PhD, is a professor in the Department of Health, Sport, and Exercise Sciences at the University of Kansas. After obtaining his bachelor's degree in physical education at Nebraska Wesleyan University, he earned his master's degree in exercise science from the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, and his doctorate in exercise physiology from Penn State University. During his two-year postdoctoral training, Fry studied cellular and molecular muscle physiology at Ohio University. This was followed by 13 years at the University of Memphis, where he was the director of, exercise, of the Exercise Biochemistry Laboratory. At the University of Kansas, he helped develop the research and coaching performance team in collaboration with University of Kansas Athletics. His research interests over the years have consistently focused on physiological and performance responses and adaptions to resistance exercises, as well as overtraining. Fry is a past vice president of the NSCA and a recipient of their Outstanding Sports Scientist Award and their Lifetime Achievement Award. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Andrew. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Alexis, and uh, thank you everyone who joined us. Uh, uh, I'm really pleased to be here today. I bring you greetings from Lawrence, Kansas, uh, where we're huddled down here um, amid the pandemic. I hope everyone is doing well wherever you are. But regardless of that, we're able to get together to talk about one of my favorite topics, and that is um, uh, really several topics. One, it's uh, resistance exercise. And more specifically, it's what happens when you do too much resistance exercise and you become overtrained. And uh, I've had a long interest in this since, uh, since my graduate study days. And I've kind of kept this line of research going for uh, you know, a long time. And uh, I've come to understand that this is a hard to understand and hard to study and hard to get your, uh, get your mind around uh, topic. So we'll talk about um, we'll talk about this today, and we'll do some operational definitions and, and some clarifications. Uh, but we're going to stay in the weight room, and we're going to look at uh, less of the physiology, what's going on hormonally, molecularly, cellularly, uh, neurologically. We're going to focus more on actual performance measures, and certainly every one of those is dependent on the underlying physiology, but we're, we're gonna stay on the athletic field, on the court, on the mat, in the weight room today. Um, and so what we see is, um, let's see, how do I advance this? There we go. So uh, much of what I'm gonna talk about today is found in one of the chapters in the, the third edition of the science and practice of strength training text that, that just came out. So if you have this text, uh, this will kind of be uh, a review, an overview of it. And, and in, that, uh, in that text, there is a, um, one of the chapters we really focus on this. And as the title of the text implies, um, the focus really is on the practice and the types of training and the results on strength and all its derivatives, power and velocity and movement patterns and so forth. So let's go back a number of years and let's go back to 1936. And we're gonna talk about some work that was done by a gentleman named Hans Selye, who is uh, originally from Hungary, uh, ended up in Canada. And uh, he developed uh, what is now known as the General Adaptation Syndrome or the GAS. 
And the first reference that you can find to this is, is in the journal Nature in 1936. This is about the easiest read that you'll ever uh, have because it's less than a page long. And he's not talking about sport uh, or high level performance. He's talking about biological systems and how they respond to stressors, how they respond they either die because of the stressor or they adapt and they move to a new level of performance or life or they're able to deal with whatever, whatever the stress is. Now, this model has come under some criticism in recent years by people saying, look, um, this, uh, this pattern that Cellier talks about doesn't exist in real life. There's a lot of examples where different things are going on. And so they've, they've kind of suggested throwing it out, um, you know, throwing it out with the trash. And I would say I, I couldn't disagree more because what Cellier did is he created a model from which we can move out to different scenarios from. So for example, on this depiction here, we see on the vertical axis, we see performance from low level performance to high level performance. And so the biological system comes in at some level of performance. And then this solid line shows where a stressor is applied and performance goes down. And at some point, the stressor is removed and the biological system begins to recover and it now adapts to a new level of performance. And whether it's a single-celled animal or whether it's a plant or whether it's you or me or one of your athletes, um, there is a pattern that emerges. Now, granted, this is a very simplistic design, but there's a, an awful lot of information in here that we'll walk you through. So Cellier eventually called this the alarm phase and performance goes down. And I want you to think about this for several ways. One way is think about a single training session. You go in, your coach gives you a training protocol, you do it, your fatigue, your performance is down, but then you leave the training hall or the practice field and you begin to recover. And in theory, if your recovery is good, you can come back and you make a little bit of a gain. Now this picture shows a huge gain but it's just for illustrative purposes. But you can also use this paradigm to look at a phase of training where maybe I'm going through two a day practices and now the coach backs off and I'm getting ready for my first competition and hopefully my first competition is out here. Now there's a couple of things I want you to notice. One is if we look on the right side, we have different levels of performance. And if the stars align and I have a good training program, I really want to have my peak performance or my personal best up here. But all of us know that there's many times where I perform submaximally. I do okay, I'm not beat up, but I'm not performing at my peak. And sometimes I have other things going on. We'll talk about these, where there's not enough training, where there's not enough recovery, or these terms that we'll talk about a little bit more, uh, different types of overreaching, or here's the big daddy of them all, uh, overtraining where it takes long-term recovery. And I wanna say before we go any further, I am a firm believer that overtraining is an overused term. Everybody talks about it when people are surveyed, um, you know, 70% of the respondents will, will say, yes, I've overtrained. If I ask my students in my classroom, a majority of hands go up, oh yeah, 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 I've overtrained. But we have to realize the classic and we'll, we'll talk about this, the classic, the official definition of overtraining requires very long recovery, not just a weekend off, not just backing off a week or a little bit. Uh, there's lesser versions of this, which can still be problematic, but, um, but they present some different things. So here we see uh, a typical training pattern. Uh, performance goes down due to stressful training. But now we see that recovery occurs and I have great performance here if I compete or if I have my next training session right here at, at A. That'd be kind of nice to be able to come back, be ready to go, have everything recovered and actually maybe a little bit of adaptation. Lots of the time we're not timing it correctly. So at B1 or B2, uh, I'm trying to either perform or train before I'm, I've really uh, benefited from all the possible adaptation. Here, I've waited too long. I'm not training uh, frequently enough or I waited too long after my last training session. So B1 and B2, that's not bad, but you, you've missed it. This is not overtraining 
this is mistiming of, of your training. So you're getting a benefit, but you're not uh, optimizing it. If I look at what happens here, this is, this is probably my current training program right here. I'm not training nearly as hard as I used to. If I was a, a, an athlete or training for high level performance, maybe in tactical strength and conditioning or some area where performance is really, really critical, um, I'm not doing enough of a stimulus, so I don't get much of a rebound. Um, the super compensation that this area represents is very small. So that's inadequate training. And here I have inadequate recovery. I'm coming back with my next training session before I'm fully recovered. And that happens all the time in two a day or three, three a day uh, uh, training sessions or American football, for example, and a lot of sports, um, you're not fully recovered. And so uh, that's inadequate recovery. If I come down here and if this line represents a training phase, C3 represents what we'll call functional overtraining. The coach has pushed you hard and now I'm gonna allow recovery and I have the potential to really capitalize on it here. But if I don't remove the stress quickly enough, I get uh, C4 where I'm just barely able to come back to where I started. Both of these are forms of what we'll call overreaching. We've stressed our system, the training is hard, performance has gone down, but what you end up seeing is in C3, it serves a purpose, it serves a function. I'm able to get a super compensation and I get a benefit from it. In C4, the stressor was not removed quickly enough or decreased in some manner quickly enough. And all I do is I get back to where I started so I don't get the benefit of super compensation. The net result is it doesn't serve a function. And we'll see an example of this. Now, the one that is that uh, a lot of people may recognize is D down here where way too much work is done. It's not removed in adequate time and it takes me weeks or months or there's even documented cases where even a year later performance is impaired. This is not just where I missed uh, performing well at a particular competition. This is where my season is probably done. Um, perhaps in some cases a career is done, but certainly it's the kind of thing where you're going to have to come back and take care of business um, next season or next year. So there's a lot of valuable information here and uh, that helps kind of differentiate a little, differentiate a little bit um, some of these different terms. Let's go on and look at um, look at another way to look at this in the in the weight room. So here we see from left on the left side of this continuum, there's no training going on. Okay, and as we move to the right, we have training going on. This is just a little bit of training. Here we've got optimal training. The person is doing well, making gains. Here's stressful training. Everyone's gone through that. We're pushing people pretty hard. Now we're moving into areas where we have functional overreaching, and I'll I will say there are uh, when done well, this is a very effective training tool, and many good coaches use this effectively. But now we move into non-functional overreaching, where um, okay, now we do have a problem, and then all the way out here we've got the full overtraining syndrome. Now let's just talk about in the weight room. In the weight room, let's split three different kinds of overtraining. And, and I'll talk first about probably what's the most common, where you do a high volume of work in the weight room. Um, many exercises, many repetitions, many, uh, many sets, the, the duration in time is long, um, you're doing multiple uh, sessions perhaps, but you're seeing a huge volume increase. And that happens in a lot of training programs. And I'll show you some examples. I think what also happens a lot is where people go too heavy. And so we're defining intensity, not as a necessarily an effort, but as a percentage of your maximum strength, percentage of one RM or, or some RM. And so we have a combination here. I think this is probably what occurs most of the time, but I will also talk some about what happens when you just go way too heavy. And there are some actual examples in the real sporting world, as well as from our laboratory on that. And so not all of these are the same. And we're gonna see, for example, high volume uh, overtraining or overreaching uh, exhibit some of the same characteristics physiologically as endurance athletes. 
um, whereas we see some really different things going on uh, at the high intensity end. It's a little bit like comparing physiologically what's going on with a marathoner versus a shot put. And the training is quite different. The physiological adaptations are different. The performance is different. Likewise, uh, what's going on with overtraining is very different. Now, a few years ago, um, the American College of Sports Medicine and the European College of Sports Science formed a task force. And uh, the results of or the results, the, the, the task force put together two documents that you can find in either Medicine and Science and Sport and Exercise or the European Journal of Sports Science uh, in 2006 and 2013 that said, one, overtraining is hard to understand. We got to get some common terminology and we need to have some operational definitions. And so this helped in many ways. And so what we see here is in this column here, we have a single training session. So in a Trino single session, I have some recovery that's required and I can recover in a day or two. Okay. Uh, hopefully the net result is if it's a well-designed program, I get an increase in performance. But let's go to the far right side. Let's go over here to the overtraining syndrome. And we're gonna call it the syndrome because this is the collection of symptoms or characteristics that happen when you overtrain or do too much. So overtraining is the process and the overtraining syndrome is the result. And this will take you months to recover and you have a decrease in performance. Now in some places um, it says, performance stagnates, and uh, that's also overtraining. And I would say, yes, that could be, because there may be a situation where you should be gaining, but you're not. And even in a good training program, everyone has phases of problem. So quite often we see increase in performance, he's training very hard. In the middle is overreading. Sometimes, um, sometimes we have uh, short-term coaching where I can recover in just days or weeks. It'd be like your day training camps for, for many sports uh, or certain uh, uh, short mesocycles for uh, say a weight training program. Functional overreaching, uh, no, uh, so let me back up. Functional overreaching, there's a benefit from this and you rebound and you're able to, to capitalize on it. Non-functional takes you longer to recover and either your performance stagnates or decreases and basically all you do is you get back to where you started. So then you have to ask the question, why did I do this? Why did I put myself through uh, this type of a training program? Now, there are plenty of examples where Maybe you, you wanted to do that for psychological reasons, for um, you know, simulating some kind of an environment. Maybe there's tactical or military applications there. But if you're looking for an increase in physical performance, uh, it's not gonna happen with, with this. And as we move from left to right, we see that the, uh, the stress of the training is, is increased. The last document in 2013 did a real nice job of also identifying, okay, where do we go from here? We got a lot of problems. Uh, what else needs to be done. And um, it's a good read. But remember, at the end of the day, we're talking about performance-based. And it's, it's not overtraining if performance isn't impaired. And so quite often you'll hear people say, well, uh, did their testosterone go down? Did their testosterone to cortisol ratio go down? You hear that all the time. Oh, it didn't go down? Well, then it's not overtraining. That's not what defines overtraining. That goes along with a lot of uh, examples of overtraining, but performance is what you base it on. In fact, there are some examples of uh, high intensity overtraining in the weight room where that ratio actually has gone up and yet performance is going down. So remember, you base it on performance. Also, I want to point out, we're not talking about muscle damage. Um, and that often comes up where people say, oh, uh, Muscle damage is one of the symptoms of overtraining. I would say in the case of our talk today, muscle damage is improperly applied training program. If it's due to the training program that I prescribe to someone, any of you folks out there, 
And it's because of what I described. I, I've done a poor job. And in fact, uh, this can lead to very serious conditions such as rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis um, is, uh, some people kind of scoff or brag about, yeah, I've had rhabdo. Uh, this is nothing to be laughed at. And I'm not a clinician, uh, but I do know this, uh, it leads to uh, kidney damage and kidney failure. And in extreme cases, it can be, it can be fatal. So I'm not talking about uh, when people have uh, extensive muscle damage or rhabdomyolysis. And in fact, if that's something that you're striving for, I've heard people say, well, I, I need to really do this, develop a lot of damage so I can get muscle growth. Well, no, because this is your muscle uh, two weeks after, uh, if you've had rhabdomyolysis. Uh, this is not very functional muscle. You've got a serious problem. So today we're not talking about muscle damage or rhabdomyolysis. And we'll see some examples where performance goes down, even though there's not soreness. You also realize to be overtrained, most of the time, you have to be well-trained to start with, okay? And so these are not beginners that are just starting out. These are people that are can do high volumes and intensities of training, and yet they have gone a little bit too far. I'll also point out the training programs we're gonna talk about are lousy training programs. So this is an example of one where we see four normal training sessions. We have a control group in white, or the slash bars, and an overtraining group in the red, and this was their volume load for one, two, three, four familiarization sessions. And then they started um, eight workout sessions. This was the volume load for the first portion of the overtraining phase. And this was the volume load for the second half of it. Huge differences. You would never hopefully prescribe this in all good intentions because this was done in order to study overtraining, what happens when you do too much. So keep in mind that some of the training programs are not good programs. We're trying to see what happens when you do too much, but it's not muscle damage. So let's look at one of the early studies that we did. Uh, this is back about a quarter century ago now. And uh, what we wanted to know was if we lift too heavy, too much too heavy. Um, and so what we did was three weeks of training in this squat simulating device we used because we wanted to control the movement patterns and we wanted, uh, we didn't want people to have any motor control uh, problems and it was easy to spot. And so we did um, Monday through Saturday, six days a week, the uh, subjects did eight sets of one at 95% of their max. And this is hard. We said we are going to drive their strength down. But what was interesting here was if we look here at their maximum strength, the training group actually went up just a little bit and then just stayed there and stayed there and stayed there. And the control group did real nice, just kind of stayed the same. And um, what happened is we, we didn't see a decrease in performance. And uh, so we ended up saying, wow, we gave them Sundays off. We didn't have them lift maximally, but on one hand, 95%, that should just crush you. And so we think this is maybe an example of overreaching. They kind of stagnated. They were lifting heavy, but they weren't getting better at lifting heavy. And so this made us realize, boy, some of the training programs may be very sensitive to small changes. So then we said, well, let's, let's up the ante a little bit. We continued using that training device. We also did some studies with free weights. And we said, let's go a little longer, two or three weeks, but now let's lift. 10 sets of one repetition at absolute maximum loads every single day. We didn't give them Sundays off. We noticed that when we gave them Sundays off, they came back Monday and they recovered some of their strength. It's like, wow, the importance of a rest day, uh, we'd really underestimate it. So uh, if you missed a lift, we just brought the weight down to a level where you could just barely get it. And you had to get 10 every single day. So on one hand, this is a pretty boring workout. Uh, a lot of motivation, a lot of encouragement. And uh, what did we see? We saw it was almost impossible to drive maximum strength down. We finally saw an 11% decrease from their max strength levels to where they were at the end of the study. And the control groups just kind of maintained. The one rep max maximum strength is really carefully preserved. And we've seen this in multiple studies now. So if you're trying to judge whether you're overtrained based on your one RM, 
your body seems to protect one RM strength pretty well. And I'll point out this was not due to muscle damage. We monitored that in, in this study. So in this case, we said, yes, it's overtrained because it took them two weeks to two months before they could return back to normal training. And we really struggled to get people uh, to, to this point. It, it was really hard to, to induce. Well, now let's take this a little bit differently. Let's go very heavy, but now let's look at free weights because I look at the protocols I just described and I said, there's no way we could do 10 sets of one with a, a barbell squat. So we said, let's go to a squat exercise and now let's back off a little bit. We're only going to train three days a week. We're only going to do back squats, two sets of one at 95%, three sets of one at 90. This was actually based on a protocol I learned from some uh, Olympic weightlifters, and they said it just crushed them. They did it uh, daily for a period of time. And look what happened. The group that trained that heavy, they got up to this level, and then they just kind of stagnated, stagnated. So even though they're lifting heavy, they kind of got to a point they weren't making any gains. and we said, okay, this is probably overreaching where they recovered in just a few weeks, but they just were not making improvements. We're gonna see some other things were going on though. So now let's look at what happens when it's high power, too much power training. So here we see an example of one of our folks in our lab doing speed squats. We have a, a Fitcherdyne attached, a tether-based system that feeds the information into the computer. And they did speed squats and uh, trained twice a day, 15 sessions for seven and a half days. And each training session, they did 10 sets of five at 70% of their system mass. So this is including the bar and the body. And then we looked at them after seven days of recovery. Well, let me describe this. This gets a little confusing. This is not a very heavy load. So for example, if you weigh hundred kilograms, and your max squat is 100 kilograms, that means the system mass, your body plus the bar, because both are moving during this exercise, is 200 kilograms. So we take 70% of that, which is 140 kilograms, but your body's taking care of 100 kilograms. So means they means uh, this individual, this example, there's only 40 kilograms on the bar. So I wanna point out, none of these subjects ever struggled through a repetition. If their speed slowed down, we bring the weight down so they could maintain speed, but it's a lot of it. So one thing that's interesting, their maximum strength didn't go down. However, we're gonna call this overreaching because what we're about to see here. Um, in this case, we see, um, well, I'm gonna back up a little bit. This is the max strength. So uh, in a study that did some almost identical, Dr. Justin Nicole out of Cal State Fullerton, uh, or no, I'm sorry, Cal State Northridge, my apologies. Um, he, uh, when he was in our laboratory, he did, um, uh, he did a kind of a replication of uh, excessive speed squat training. And again, the, whether you're in the control group that's open circle or the shaded group, uh, back squat strength did not go down. Knee extension strength did not go down. In fact, it went up just a little bit. So even though you're doing a lot of power training, it doesn't hurt your maximum strength. But um, once again, because of what we're gonna see in a minute, this was overreaching because it does affect power. Well, what happens, let's look at some other um, protocols. What happens when you're doing a huge volume? So the volume load goes way up. If you want to calculate the total work in joules, uh, that goes way up. Uh, the sets, the reps, the frequency, however it's done, the number of exercises. Um, we see that there's a number of studies that have, have looked at this. And, and what we see is that the individuals, they make a gain, they make a gain, and then they get one or two weeks of very high volume training thrown on them. Performance goes down. And we see that strength levels go down, and, but then they kind of recover once you remove that stimulus. So whether this is overtraining, it's probably a form of overreaching. This has uh, occurred in a number of scenarios. These two lines uh, actually represent, um, one was a, a group that got a supplement. So whether it's creatine or carbohydrates or protein or pre-workout, uh, a number of supplements 
can help you deal with this stressful training here. This group got the placebo and this group would get one of the supplements. Uh, so some of them do have uh, a beneficial effect and help people not, uh, help them tolerate the training stress a little bit better. So again, I would say these, this is an overreaching example. Let's talk about the sport of American football. Okay, and this is a crazy sport. I love it. It's crazy. There's so much going on. It's understudied, in my opinion. But let's talk about what's going on in the off season. So here we see um, what's going on for the barbell squat and the bench press for a subset of uh, American football players at a collegiate setting. Test one was their maximum squat strength when they got back after the holiday break in January. Test two was after uh, four or five weeks, I forget which it was, where they're only in the weight room. And test three is they continue lifting, but now one of the other coaches has implemented an early morning conditioning program with a huge volume of foot contacts for plyometrics, a huge volume of uh, sprint interval repeats, agility runs. Basically, we're going to work you for about 45 minutes to 60 minutes till you can hardly stand and then you can go back and lift in the afternoon. And then we have spring football practice here. And what we see is maximum strength, the lifting program did a good job. People got stronger, but now let's add this conditioning program and the lifting program adjustments were not made. They were making good progress before, why not continue? Instead, the conditioning program interfered. And then they didn't do any lifting during spring football and they got back right where they started. Same thing for upper body, good gains, and then starting to drift back down. The net result is, is they started out right where they, or they ended up right where they started. Why did I even do this in the first place? This winter lifting should be some of the best time to make gains for this sport. So in this case, I'm, I think this is a clear example of non-functional overreaching. It was a missed opportunity. No one was injured, not muscle damage, but a real problem. Let's look at a completely different sport, Olympic style weightlifting. We had a chance to look at uh, the junior national squad here in the United States. And for two years in a row, they did a week of very stressful training where training volumes were increased tremendously. And a year later, a number of the same athletes came back and did the same protocol. But what's interesting is if we look at their snatch strength. Now, these are 15 to 19 year old uh, young lifters, kind of the future lifters in our country at the time. Uh, we see that their strength didn't go down. Not a huge, not much difference, no significant increase. It did increase the next year. They were a year uh, older. Uh, but 1RM strength on the snatch lift did not go down. However, this was a, an example of overreaching because we saw other performances went down and they were spending a lot of time doing fairly heavy lifts, but they weren't getting the benefit. Now I'll point out here, this is overreaching and I would say probably functional because each of those lifters, uh, three weeks after that stressful training phase, they had a major competition and it was documented that many of them did very well, rebounded well, and so they got a, a, a super compensation effect. One thing, though, among that group is when we saw people at the beginning of that stressful phase and then a week later, um, after a huge increase in uh, the volume for the whole week, and, and I say greater than or equal to a threefold increase in training volume, uh, that was the minimum difference. For many, it was much higher. The bar trajectory started changing. And if you're into uh, weightlifting, you know that you have to be careful about swinging the bar away from your body. And uh, the coaches and video analysis documented that uh, bar trajectories were starting to change. Not enough to become a problem yet, but uh, it was thought that this was a, an impending problem. So what can we say about strength? Uh, in strength, I think we can say, um, this is uh, uh, pretty stable. It's hard to decrease strength. Uh, and it's not a sensitive indicator of training status. We think it's very specific to the, to the exercise that's being trained. Um, we think that high volumes of weight training might produce a slight decrease in strength, but we also know that uh, high power training doesn't seem to have an adverse effect on it. 
we think that free weights, you're more sensitive to, to overtraining than, than on machines. And um, what's going on outside the weight room can be a really, um, can be a really big factor. So um, I think that that's, a, um, I think that's something that we need to keep in mind. Um, if I am a strength coach and you came to me as a sport coach and you said, wow, my athletes are, um, they're just not very sharp. What are you doing in the weight room? And I say, hey, their, their maximum strength is fine. You know, just test them. They're okay. They're maintaining. Uh, that really is not an adequate test because maybe there is something I'm doing in the weight room uh, or somewhere else that uh, could, uh, could become a problem. Well, let's take a, a quick look at some other possible uh, variables we might want to look at because 1RM strength is pretty simplistic. So well, how about isometric force? Uh, and sometimes we'll do this with a, a knee extension test. We can do isometric tests with other modalities. We've never found this to work, to, to, to be sensitive to this. And, and if you look at pre-overtraining, uh, the middle of overtraining, uh, post-overtraining, overtrain group, control group, the, there's no significant difference here. We've never seen it. It's like, wow, uh, we're kind of wasting our time monitoring this. Uh, if we get onto an isokinetic device and we set it to zero speed, we don't see a change from uh, pre, mid to post. And the controls that are doing an e program, they're actually getting a nice recovery and rebound. So isometric tests, no. But if we start moving the joint, and this is slow speed, 30 degrees per second. This is a high speed, I think it's 300 degrees per second of knee extension. We see huge decreases within a week. So one, you begin a dynamic activity. There's actually joint movement going on. And now we see that performance decreases and decreases pretty rapidly. And sometimes you can even do multi-joint isokinetic types of tests as we see on the right. We can also do an isometric test and we can stimulate the muscle. In this case, if it's knee extension, we wanna stimulate the uh, the anterior thigh, so it's all the quadricep muscles and a few others, your sartorius is in there, because we stimulate the femoral nerve. And the femoral nerve takes care of the anterior compartment of the thigh. And if we do a super maximum stimulation from before overtraining to a week later, we see that stimulated strength goes down uh, over 20%. So what does this mean? This means that I'm artificially stimulating. It's not due to me voluntarily activating the muscle under my control. The stimulating machine is doing it. Something is wrong in the muscle or in the neuromuscular junction or conceivably along the, the neural pathway from the site of stimulation, which is at the top of the thigh, uh, right next to the uh, um, femoral artery is where you stimulate. Now, from a physiological standpoint, I'm all excited because this is a huge, uh, this tells me something's going on out there. But it also tells me I've done something here that's not muscle damage and it's impairing performance. How about rates of force development? So how much does force go up and how long does it take to get there? So it's in newtons per second. And we've done this with knee extension. I was so excited about this and it was so disappointing. We have never found knee extension isometric rate of force development to be effective. Very disappointing. Okay, well, so we've kind of moved a little bit away from that. However, I do want to point out a real popular test that, that uh, Dr. Mike Stone at East Tennessee has, has made very popular and a number of others as well, is uh, isometric mid-thigh pull. And we don't currently do this in our lab, but we will this begin to this coming year. And so basically you're using your entire body and you are looking at, these are just a, a sample force time curves. Uh, and the solid line is, let's say this is a, a normal pre-overtraining. The dotted line is what I'm supposing might happen with overtraining, where now it takes longer to get there. Maximum force is probably the same. It would be my guess, I don't know that for sure, but the slope here changes. And if I'm an athlete, that's a problem because now uh, I'm able to generate force uh, not as quickly. And if uh, my opponent uh, isn't experiencing that, they, they have an advantage. So I think this is a very promising kind of uh, uh, test because
because there's evidence that it's responsive to different phases of the training program as well. Now, this is anecdotal, uh, or this is information I got from our strength coach, uh, Andrea Hoody, who's now at the University of Texas. For a long time, she was here at, at Kansas, and, and uh, I loved going over to her shop and, and talking with her and finding out what she was doing. And in her, uh, and they still have it, uh, Luke Bradford uh, is in charge of the weight room now there, where they have six uh, uh, plates. And they do, they're able to, every day if they want, do vertical jump tests, and look at the force curve, on uh, just a standard counter movement vertical jump test. One of the variables they see is this eccentric rate of force development. And there's a lot of different ways to calculate rates of force development. But um, she has felt through years, uh, trial and error, and seen it in, in her athletes that this eccentric rate of force development may be sensitive to the training loads. Now I wanna point out, this is not scientific, but this is extremely valuable because everyone thinks a sports scientist comes up with ideas for the coaches and that happens but i think more of the time the coaches are trying things and seeing things and thank heavens they tell us where we can go back in the lab and see if we can make some sense out of it so uh that could be a dynamic explosive activity that maybe there's some validity to and that warrants looking at however remember height uh, jump height is is not very sensitive, uh, so it doesn't matter how uh, how high you you jump. Um, and I mean, how stressed you are, uh, jump height isn't affected. How about power? Um, let's look at what happens to power. And so here we have a control group that's measuring power at light, medium, and heavy loads. Look at the overtraining group. Power is not affected except at the loads that they trained at. We see this huge decrease. This is when people were doing heavy single lifts. So now it's like, wow, power may be more sensitive. But again, jump height was not affected. There's so many different ways that a, a body can, can attain a jump height that we think that's how they accommodate. How about the power that occurs when you're doing um, very, uh, uh, very stressful training? And here we see pre-overtraining, post-overtraining, and then a week of recovery. We see that the overtrained group, their power at a at a um, at least the barbell power at seventy percent loads decrease and then recover. And we also see the same thing for the velocity of the bar. So power decreased, uh, velocity decreased, and we've seen this again in the recent study by Dr. Nicole with uh, speed squats training, where you're doing a lot of high power training and yet the overreached group just kind of stagnated, the control group actually was making nice progress. So we think power is more sensitive. And we see that, saw this with the football players. Uh, as soon as they did that early morning conditioning, power started going down and vertical jump height just kind of stagnated. And this is not what you really want for off season training. So we think this is a great example of non-functional overreaching. You know, I love where I work because I'm right across the street from the indoor track. And so I can sneak out of my office, run over and catch a meet. And, uh, but this kind of speaks to, I think what's really at uh, the heart of a, a lot of sports. What about speed? What's going on with speed? Now, the few times that we've actually done sprint tests, and this is just a 10 yard or a 9.1 meter sprint, and we've done overreaching where strength didn't go down, but we see that sprint speed, even just 10 yards, they lost over a tenth of a second in speed. They're getting slower, and it's because of what we did in the weight room. There was no nothing else that was going on. And if I look at the classic uh, football example, 40 yard sprint, we see that there's a decrease in sprint speed of over two tenths of a second. If that's this gentleman right here, he's gonna get caught. And if it's his opponents, then he's gonna sprint away from them because something that went on in the weight room is having an adverse effect on sprint. And we see this very, very, uh, almost every time that we've done a sprint test. So big deal, what's a tenth of a second, two tenths of a second? Well, here's what a big deal it is. You're over half a meter behind 
after 10 yards. You're 0.11 seconds slower. Yeah, big deal. This is a big deal. If I'm chasing the soccer ball, I can't, I can't get to it before my opponent. And if it's a longer distance, I'm 1.3 meters behind. This is huge. And here's an example. So this, these subjects are not overtrained, but let's look at the gentleman who's closest to us and the second person. Just imagine the closest guy has done a good job and he's recovered. The difference between the closest guy and the second lane is probably the difference we just saw on a 10 meter sprint. If they're going out for a pass in football, chasing a loose ball in basketball, chasing a soccer ball, whatever, they're in a track meet, it, it, it's all over. And it's all over from the very beginning. So uh, I'll go through some of these. Uh, uh, I don't want to go too fast, but I want to hit just a few highlights here. And if I'm, if I'm going too long, uh, hopefully Alexis will, will rein me in here. What are some other things that we see that when we're going too heavy? And uh, one thing I'll point out is when we've looked at how many repetitions that can be performed as you're going through an overtraining protocol, the number of reps that can be done at a set percentage of your max doesn't change. But because your max strength is being adversely affected, the total work that you can do during a training session is, is becoming impaired. And what is also interesting, even though we didn't, uh, well, um, we've been saying that there was uh, not much damage. Now, someone could look at this and say creatine kinase, which is an indirect marker of muscle damage or muscle disruption, and say, look, it went up and all, it doubled. Wow, this is muscle damage. And I say, no, it's not. If you're going to study creatine kinase responses, you need to know what are typical responses. If this was true muscle damage, this number would have been in the thousands. This is a level that you get after what is a normal training session, okay? So this is, even though statistically significant, it's not a muscle damage protocol. And even though we didn't monitor or we didn't uh, control diets, the overtrained group, uh, even though they're just doing very heavy, not huge volumes, they on their own adjusted their caloric intake and their carbohydrate intake. And we think this was done in an attempt to try to maintain performance. Um, one or two last things I'll talk about are the psychological aspect that is uh, a, a really good area to look at and is not looked at enough. When people did 10 sets of one maximum lifts every day, if, when they finished each lift every day, we said, how difficult was this on a scale of zero to 10? And we see that because we we're adjusting the weights, it was very difficult, but it stayed constant across the two weeks of training. But before they lifted, we asked them how confident they were in making it. And they knew this was a weight that was set as close as possible to the absolute maximum. And so the red bars are the lifts they made, the blue bars are the lifts they missed. And even though they knew that this was a load that they should be able to make, after a week, after seven training days, they were less confident. This is called self-efficacy. And so if my athletes are becoming less confident in performance, that's huge. And, and you can think of a ton of examples out on the athletic field where um, self-confidence will take you a long ways. And now we're doing something that impairs it. So that became a problem here. So where are we? Let's summarize. One arm strength is pretty stable. Uh, Multi-joint measures of force may be better. I, I think that's true. Dynamic measures, I think, are better to uh, if you're trying to track performance. Rate of force development, very promising, but definitely more work's needed there. Uh, if you go very heavy, then power and speed are uh, impaired. Um, if you do a lot of high power training, it doesn't really hurt your max strength levels, but it can affect other things. So power is more sensitive uh, to overtraining than, than maximum strength. Speed, we think, is really, really sensitive to overtraining. We believe your capacity to do a workout is decreased. We think the mental game is huge. Don't, don't overlook that. So we kind of come up with this continuum here of, and this is extremely debatable. Someone else could come up with a different order, but we, we as much as I love to look at performance and physiology, uh, psychological variables uh, seem to pop up as being very sensitive. And 
um, but you know, neural recruitment, speed, and rate of force development impairment, and you move on down to finally reduce capacity, and you have the full-blown overtraining syndrome. So that's it in a nutshell, and uh, thank you for listening, and uh, I'd be more than happy to take some questions. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, this is a great presentation. We do have a couple of questions that came through for us. Um, the first one is, what does adequate recovery or where does adequate re adequate recovery fall in the Staley model? Or I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. The Staley model. Yeah. And they're asking where does recovery fall. Well, let's go take a look at. It. Let's. Uh, are you still able to see this, Alexis? Yep, you're still on screen. Yep. Okay. So let's go to let's go to that slide. So adequate recovery. I'll just kick my camera hopefully i'm still there adequate recovery is um you know if you are at least in theory now you're you have made an ad a positive adaptation if you're anywhere here underneath in this area of the supercompensation or overcompensation curve ideally you're up here at a this is where okay wherever it is i am in my training that that's optimal you're not always able to do that you don't get, you know, you, you've got to plan your training around your competition schedule. Um, and if you've timed it well, then this uh, then this will be, uh, you know, I can do this okay. But if I, um, but if I um, don't time it as well, I don't get the same benefit. But if I'm not allowing enough recovery, um, then I'm down here. So basically we're talking over here on this, this right side of the curve. So hopefully that kind of, kind of answers. And again, this picture here is is an over it's, it's an exaggeration of the magnitude of the of the changes for for many of these, but the concept is there. Okay, okay. So another question we received is: student athletes not only have to deal with physical but with mental internal load. Um, is there any way for coaching staff to control that rather subjective load? So, do you have suggestions on how coaches could manage that? Well, yeah, um, and this is a whole different talk. Um, some of you who know me know that uh, my wife is Dr. Mary Fry in her area of sports psychology. And I find this really fascinating and I, I hope that we can, uh, we've collaborated on some of this stuff all, all, already, but uh, one of her areas of study is creating, uh, is the um, uh, achievement goal theory, uh, where a coach, or a professor, or teacher, or a supervisor at work, or a um, or whatever the person in charge can create a climate that uh, fosters um, an appreciation of effort and fosters an appreciation of improvement, uh, as opposed to uh, just performance. Obviously, an athlete is training to enhance performance. Obviously, competition is based on performance at the end of the day you go on the playing field and you get a score or you jump a height or whatever it is and you um and there is a winner and there's a second and a third place so forth but at some point you also have to say look if i can train my individuals and um uh, uh create an appreciation if everyone gives me their best effort and everyone shows improvement what more can I ask for as a coach or a personal trainer or as a professor? You know, not everyone's an A student. You know, if I can uh, spark some excitement or desire in my students, maybe that's the, the same thing. Um, but creating that environment and, and that environment also affects the physiology. And we've done some work. We didn't talk about it today, but I've done some work in conjunction with my life's uh, exercise, uh, my wife's exercise and sports psychology lab, where um, we look at the stress hormone response to these different environments in a teaching and learning and performance environment. And um, I kind of went into that thinking, oh, we're not gonna see much. I was, I was astounded at the difference. And, um, you know, we probably all had teachers, professors, bosses that we just detested and just turned you off completely. And, um, and it's like, that's a shame because it doesn't have to be that way. So uh, this falls under the realm of uh, coach education, but it's also under the, the umbrella of uh, sport and exercise psychology, and it dovetails exactly 
with performance, uh, with sport performance. And um, uh, so that's, uh, that's one area for sure. People like to have surveys and look at profile of mood states and can we do various tests to determine uh, uh, is a person overtrained? And this is not scientific, but I, I believe that there are many very good coaches that are attuned to what their athletes are thinking and doing and they can tell when something is amiss and it's not a perfect science but um you know and I, i'll put that under the the sports psychology side of things so those are just a, a few ideas okay okay all right uh when you're working with high school athletes what are two or, that maybe are in two or three sports how can you avoid overtraining for those uh athletes so the question is which sports so let's say an athlete is in maybe two or three sports, um, and the, the person is asking about overtraining if they're participating in more than one sport. So how can you avoid overtraining in that situation? Yeah. So that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a common problem at, at, the, at the high school level or at the youth level. Um, you know, you have a multi-sport athlete. So you, you've got a couple things going on. I'll give you a couple scenarios. Uh, the classic example is in uh, a high school setting. Uh, I play a fall sport, a winter sport, and a spring sport. And maybe I also have a summer sport. So um, I, I really don't have an off season. Um, if you talk about youth sport before they get into organized uh, sport through the school system, you've got kids who go to soccer practice in the morning and then they do another sport, swim practice you know, in the afternoon, and then they have a meet, and, you know, I mean, they're in multiple leagues, they're in multiple, and it's all at the same time, and it's literally just going from one, I mean, it's just start of the day, they're shuttling from one sporting event to the next, um, which is a, a, another topic, but I mean, I, I have seen this, I've had uh, athletes that I've worked with that are going through that, and, uh, um, but let's go to the school setting, you have to uh, be able to accommodate the training stresses. You know that the practice stresses uh, you may not be able to control. If you're not the uh, if you're not the sport coach, say it's a football in the fall, basketball in the winter, and track in the spring, and so you know that um, uh, well, the basketball coach isn't going to back off, so um, the the off season football player can do. Um, you know, more training, say, in the weight room, uh, you're going to have to modify the training so that you can accommodate the practices that are going on in basketball. And I think what you're going to find is the volume is going to be pretty low. But the good news is you can have a, you can still have a very effective training program with very modest training volumes. And it helps keep the, the individual fresher, cleaner, uh, uh, fresher, uh, sharper, um, enjoying it a little bit better. Um, but you will have to make an adjustment on, on the training volume. And, um, you know, I used to be involved with um, running a preseason uh, kind of conditioning program for baseball. Well, some of the guys were in the middle of their basketball season. And it's like um, you had to back off some of the conditioning stuff we did because um, priority was the in-season sport. So the good news is, there's a lot of ways that you can you can decrease that and they're not cheating themselves that's probably the biggest problem people like oh i'm cheating myself i gotta do more and more no no you you don't so i don't know if that's that's kind of a uh, kind of a weenie answer but <laughs> decreasing so the volume uh, is going to be critical okay um another question we have is if there are gender differences when it comes to overtraining Ooh, great question. A gender difference. You know, I struggle with this because, you know, for, you know, there, there, there's a lot of books out there that talk about training for women. And, you know, when I teach my strength and conditioning class, um, I really approach it where all these training principles are pretty much the same for men and women. Now there are some differences. You, you know, you have the menstrual cycle and changing hormonal environment, and you have the issue of, uh, for some individuals, water retention. Uh, sometimes there's a decreased performance during certain times uh, of the menstrual cycle. Though those exist, but uh, as far as the training volumes, 
that uh, females are capable of doing, you know, as long as they're at the same stage as far as training history, training experience, fitness levels, um, I don't see strong evidence that, okay, women just have to do less or they have to go lighter. You know, this will date me, but some of you out there listening may, may remember when I was in high school, the longest event that uh, girls could run on track was the half mile, 880 yards. It's now the 800 meters because uh, I was too, you know, anything longer, that's, that's a little bit tough for, for females to do. And it's like, we know that's preposterous now. So um, I think, uh, um, I think it's, uh, they're, they're coaching, you know, I'm not enough of an expert to know the approaches. I've heard enough coaches talk about, you know, approaching their male and female athletes maybe a little bit differently, uh, at least sport coaches. But um, still, the basic principles are going to apply, and you still need to be have a good rapport with your athletes. And um, so, I, I would say any of these things would apply equally to to males. Okay. And we have a couple questions about sleeping, um, and and then one of them is also tied into nutrition. So it says. In a situation where lack of sleep and poor diet and other physical factors will contribute to overtraining, um, but people still must lift, what are your recommendations for, for, for that? So people getting enough sleep or certain nutritional needs um, in regards to overtraining? You know, overtraining, you know, and I didn't have a uh, uh, from East Tennessee, uh, almost always has slides in his cumulative effect of uh, stresses are cumulative. Everything is on. Today, we're just about what's going on in the weight room and a little bit of how sports-specific training ties in, but everything outside can be contributing fast. You know, school, job stresses, uh, you know, family or spouse or boyfriend, girlfriend, um, you know, I, I don't know, whatever, it can all, it can all uh, uh, contribute. So certainly sleep and diet are, are, are critical. And I've heard it said, and I'm not a dietitian. you know, I've done some nutrition related stuff mainly because we've done some, some supplement work, but uh, I've heard it said, and I'd have to agree, um, a good diet will not make a champion, but a poor diet will ruin one. And I think there's some truth to that. You know, just because you eat great doesn't mean you're, uh, you're going to be the, the best performer, but uh, you might be taking the edge off of a great performance if you're not accompanying it with, with optimal uh, uh, nutritional practices. Uh, same thing with sleep. Uh, I think a lot is coming out now where, um, and people have known this for a long time, and successful athletes have known this a long time, um, you need to sleep a lot um, for recovery. And, um, you know, the, the, antithesis of this was if any of you uh, have ever read any history of uh, and all uh, his manager was uh, as he come in uh, they had been been to bed for it how his career different uh even more uh, he'd actually do some, some good training. I will point out also, I think one of the first doc examples of a trainer uh, was in his career, they grew um, person to be a personal. Actually, did to try to shape and they, they maybe milked a few more years out of his career uh, for that, uh, which is uh, different from the question. Uh, sleep has got to be a factor. There's not a lot of it on in the overtraining literature. Um, there is a book. This has been quite a while ago. Uh, there was a conference on overtraining and overreaching uh, recovery in sport that came out of Ulm, Germany. Uh, Manfred Lehmann organized it, and I believe there's a chapter in there on sleep. Uh, but it's you know uh, an interesting area that should be looked at more. Okay, um, so we have a few more questions, but I think we're just gonna address one more for sake of time. Um, and the question is, how do you know if you're working hard enough in any given session or if you're overtraining? So can you tell in a particular session or is this a cumulative effect? You know, um, 
I think there's a couple things that could be really helpful. One of them is um, if you are, if you're the coach, well, and uh, you know the athlete also, but if you're the coach or trainer, and you are familiar with this individual, and you see that uh, typically they have a certain training ethic, they have a, a you know they there's a pattern, certain motivation, and you see that there's a decrease in that, a decreased desire to train. In fact, I mentioned that some of the questionnaires that we've used and some of the psychological variables, every time we've done an overtraining or overreaching study or stress study on stressful training, we have these questionnaires that the individuals fill out before their training. And the first thing that goes in the trash is their desire to train. Would you like to skip today? You know, maybe I could just put it off today or something that gets at that. And these are people that are highly motivated, especially if you're talking about athletes and they, yes, I want to, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm working out. And then it just starts dropping off a little bit. Uh, that is something where, you, um, you know, and it's hard to know, is the person just sandbagging on me or is this for real? So that that's a, a little bit hard, but we consistently see that. Um, I think measures of speed. Um, you know, and this kind of gets into the area of velocity-based training, uh, where people say, I'm going to adjust my loads based on some velocity-based measure uh, that I'm doing prior to the workout. Um, auto-regulation, if you will. It's a, you know, there's a whole different ways to do it, a number of different ways to auto-regulate. But um, if I'm seeing a decrease in, in velocity of some kind, that suggests that, okay, maybe we need to back off a little bit. Well, that kind of gets back to this concept of maybe speed is one of the most sensitive measures. Now, is it sprint speed? Is it uh, speed under a moderate load bar? Is it, uh, you know, speed on a force plate, rates of force development, you know? Um, so I think there probably are some some measures that, that you could pick up on early. Um, I was just watching my son work out uh, yesterday or day before yesterday and, uh, well, actually the last few days. And and uh, you can tell when he's had quite a lot of training load because, okay, some of the workouts that follow, okay, maybe not quite as much zip to it. And that's okay. You know, that, that happens. You have a very uh, stressful training session. It takes a while to come back. You can visually see that. And the athlete can visually, can, can physically feel it. Um, you know, days when, uh, back when I used to train a lot harder, if I was fatigued, boy, I couldn't snatch to save my life. Uh, I couldn't anyway, I guess. But uh, uh, but I mean, loads that you would expect to get. So, wow, just wasn't there. Uh, same thing with jerk. And well, these are related to, to speed. So I, I think some of those types of measures uh, become very, very apparent. And I would think they're probably some of the first. Okay. All right. Well, um, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. We're a little past 3 p.m. So I want to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. And Andrew, thank you for, for a great presentation. And you can purchase his book, Science and Practice of Strength Training, on our website at us.humankinetics.com. So again, I just want to thank everyone for coming. And uh, we hope you'll join us for future webinars. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.